seems a little silly, but what is your name? What's your job title? <laughs> my job title, well, my name's Rebecca Rush. Uh, my job title is a professional athlete and now author, which both of those kind of make me laugh because it wasn't what I planned, but yeah. And a part-time firefighter. Uh, where'd you grow up and how did that shape who you are now? I grew up in the Midwest, so uh, suburbs of Chicago, so this is very familiar territory here uh, to me, sort of the gray winter and all that. Um, and I grew up in uh, with a single mom um, and my sister, and so mom was at work all the time, and, and what that really, I think what that really reinforced for me was a lot of independence, and my sister and I kind of taking care of ourselves and fending for ourselves. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good time. I, I definitely, as a kid, you know, camped out in the backyard, and you know, we'd do summer camping trips, and it was definitely sort of my uh, desire to kind of be outside and exploring and all that. So I think that kind of started uh, the wanderlust thing that has kind of defined my career. How did you get into riding bikes? I got into riding bikes um, only because I had to, because I had no other choice. <laughs> um, for a long time, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I was a rock climber, a paddler, adventure racer, um, did a lot of different sports, and uh, I really only rode a bike because it was included in adventure racing, and so you had to. It was one of the multiple sports um, that were included, and it was my worst sport. I hated it. Um, I couldn't understand why anyone would ride a bicycle because they always broke. They were annoying. I wasn't any good at it. I hated it. Um, but then when adventure racing kind of died and went off, uh, went off television and Mark Burnett, who was a producer of Eco Challenge, went on to Survivor and Bigger Better Things. Uh, and so the sport kind of dried up and I was left with a year contract with Red Bull and they're just like, well, do something for the year. like. Just go find something cool to do. And uh, with my endurance experience, the longest thing I could find was 24-hour uh, mountain bike racing. And it was, you know, kind of a joke because I sucked. And I didn't like riding a bike. Um, but I figured, oh, I just have to stay up one night instead of seven. Like, no big deal. I can stay up all night, even if I have to run my bike. Um, and so my boyfriend, Greg, kind of helped me get involved with it. He was a cyclist at the time. And uh the first 24-hour solo race I did, I beat everybody, including the guys. So decided, okay, well, this is what I'll do for the year. And that was really just supposed to be a one-year kind of uh, last hurrah before I had to get a real job. And uh, that was eight years ago and kind of launched this whole unexpected cycling career with some world championships and things like that. And uh, so it was totally like Phoenix rising from the ashes. You know, I thought I'd lost my job and was done. And then this whole bike thing launched. And of course now cycling's become my main sport and my passion, which was my weakness. And you know, the sport I hated the most <laughs> eight years ago. <laughs> so it was never too late. Um, I mean, that's what I think is so cool about your story. So I know you first and foremost as a cyclist mm -hmm. and reading your book and just getting to, you know, your, know your biography a little bit more is just that a determination like yeah. you turn something you hate into something that you you know you're just like don't give up it's like i'm gonna i'm gonna learn this and conquer it and thank you that. it's just really really admirable thank you um, so cycling aside <laughs> what's your favorite outdoor activity besides cycling well it's a toss-up between i mean rock climbing is probably my first love um but uh, i have a, a new dog and so actually going running and you know hiking and playing with the dog and playing frisbees actually become uh, sort of one of my outdoor passions because he's just so happy to be out there and just kind of makes me want to be outside all the time so it's a toss-up between climbing and the dog oh, what's your dog's name diesel, diesel. yeah <laughs> uh tell me about your worst day on the bike Let's see. Uh, worst day on the bike. Um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, gosh, you know, recently my worst day on the bike. Um, and, and there's a lot of ups and downs. This is something that is interesting that people think that, you know, if you've won a bunch of races, you're a professional athlete, that everything is somehow easy for you. And that, you know, oh, I just go win a race. No problem. Um, and I'll, you know, there's more failures than wins for sure that people don't see. They don't see the dark times or me crying or throwing my bike. You know, people don't see that. And even really recently, um, I was in a race in Brazil, um, seven day stage race and day two, I was totally heat stroke, lying in the fetal position on the side of the road, you know, wanting to quit, telling my teammate, just go on without me. You know, I mean, seriously, like dangerously, uh, you know, the temperatures are 120 degrees and it was a, 
140 kilometer stage. It was only stage two of seven, you know, and I was in a pretty dark place. Um, and literally, yeah, wanting to just be left by the side of the road in Brazil, you know, in a ball. And uh, <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty hard day. But, you know, Ali got me through it and we worked it out. And, you know, the, the fastest way to actually get through it was to just get to the finish line. And because there was kind of no option for a rescue. And so we just trotted and walked the bikes and, you know, put water in our head and, you know, got through and uh, and finished the stage. But and then the next day went way better. So, you know, it was kind of the ups and downs. It happened all the time with with riding a bike or doing any sport. Well, in contrast to that, what's one of your you know, <laughs> biggest highs on a bike? One of your best moments? Probably the last 24 hour solo race that I did um, was in Canmore. Um, was a really cool experience. I was going for a three P, you know, so um, there's a big target on my back. But what was really cool about that day is it was very technical riding, which isn't my forte necessarily. And so, you know, I was riding well. Uh, had a, my best friends as crew members, and um, my boyfriend Greg, well, husband now. It's hard to say that. <laughs> he was also racing single speed, and we ended up uh, both of us defending our titles and both winning world championships on the same day on the same course, and it was really cool to, for a solo experience to actually, you know, kind of be part of a team and share that with him and share, share that with my friends. And a lot of people think bike racing is solo, but it, it's definitely not. So that was a pretty cool day. That is cool. <laughs> and then we fell asleep at awards, you know, as they're calling our name, because basically you can't stand after a 24 hour solo. And yeah, there's no kind of not a lot of celebration or partying or, you know, you have, you know, food and beer and then fall asleep in your plate. <laughs> Um, and I kind of, in reading your book, I kind of love that about um, you being known as not being a very pretty uh, mountain biker, <laughs> just like, you know, not being very technically savvy and just yeah. getting kind of thrown around at first. Um, how did that, you know, hearing people talk about you in that way, how did that change you or it motivate you or did it at all or did you just not care? It, of course I cared. I mean, there are a lot of courses where I would pre-ride with Greg and I'm like, I can't ride this. I'd be crying going, oh, I can't do it. Like, what am I doing here? And, you know, it, sure enough, when the gun goes off or the middle of the night, and that was interesting about, you know, a lot of the nighttime racing is I would actually ride better at night when I kind of, I was tired. My brain had stopped telling myself I couldn't do it and you kind of couldn't see. And so you end up just kind of riding stuff that you didn't think you could. Um, and I think the repetition of 24 hour racing on the same course is actually what really kind of helped me start to get better because you had to keep going over that same section that maybe you ran the first time and the second time, and then you got it on the third time and sort of, sort of that repetition and that, um, kind of reinforcement. But yeah, I don't, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing for people to be like, yeah, she technically, she kind of sucks. And, you know, I pass all these people on the climbs and then get past on the descents. You're like, oh, I'm losing, you know, it's free, you know, yeah. descending. And, so, and I'm still working on it. You know, it's a lesson that I'll never learn completely. I mean, people who learn to ride as kids or, you know, people I know who learn to ride a bike out east, you know, on the roots and rocks, they're just head and shoulders ahead of me. But I mean, what I've learned to focus on is, you know, I have endurance, I can go a long time, I can keep going. And so I have to think about those strengths. And in courses where, you know, maybe I lose time on the technical, I have to really work the hill climbs or the other parts where I know those are my strengths. So everybody's, you know, got their good and bad and you just keep trying to work on the bad and, and, and exploit your good parts as much as you can. Uh, really important question. <laughs> Shorts or bibs? Shorts, for sure. Shorts? Yeah. And bibs. Well, if you race for 13 hours, 24 oh, hours, right, 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 right. seven days, <laughs> there's like, quick. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's definitely more of a logistics sure. thing yeah. of like, yeah, because the time never stops. Clock yeah. doesn't stop in those endurance races. So, you know, yeah, shorts. Just shorts. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. What's your favorite dessert? I don't know if I have one. See, I think people are either salty or sweet people yeah. at, at heart, and I'm more of a salty person. So it's like, what do you crave when you're like in so the like deepest, and darkest place? Or yeah, or chips or pretzels or. So yeah, I'm probably more of a salty person. So I, I don't have a favorite dessert. Isn't that weird? I mean, I like chocolate. You know, yeah. I like desserts. But if like you did those psychology experiments where you're sitting there and there's salty and sweet food, I would choose the salty. Greg would choose the sweet. <laughs> That's a good pair. Then. That's why salted caramel goo is so amazing because everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. 
what is the one thing you always bring with you on a ride no matter what? Gosh, that's a really good question. I try to bring a good attitude, but it doesn't always come with me <laughs> on those like cold <laughs> training days in the winter. Um, you know, there's some standbys. I've got the Garmin. I, I like to record, you know, what I'm doing. Um, the coach likes to look at it. Yeah. Um, I usually have some goose in my pocket and some water. But really, yeah, it's pretty simple. I, I don't always ride with a cell phone. I don't always, you know, I'm not always tracking stuff. But Do you listen to music when you ride? I, I listen to music, things like on the trainer, places where like I'm not inspired by visually like what's going on around me. But um, racing, I don't I don't wear music, and usually if I'm outside and out on mountain bike trails, I generally don't need music. Huh. Yeah. So favorite song? <laughs> uh, favorite song is probably um, a song that uh, Greg played for me before our 24 hour world um, by Two Skinny Jays. It's called You're a Champion. And he like turned it on in the morning and he likes to play it for me every once in a while to kind of get me motivated. So, and I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> you won't sing it for us. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'm worse than technical mountain bike riding is actually singing. Right. So <laughs> you can look it up. Okay. What uh, advice would you give to a new rider looking to get into the sport? I think... Um, for new riders, and it's something I still feel like I'm a new rider, so I can relate when I teach clinics and all that. And I, I remember, you know, it's still fresh of like, oh, the bike is intimidating, or I don't know how to do the gears, and there's too much stuff going on. And so that's one of the barriers is the education about, about the bike. And so, you know, first I would say a good bike makes a lot of difference. You know, I had a bad bike for a really long time that I didn't realize it was a hand-me-down. It didn't fit me. Um, and once I got a good bike, I was actually like, oh, this is a little more fun. Okay, I kind of get it. So I think, you know, getting the best equipment that you can. Um, but then I also think that you need some friends. You need people to like, be like, come on, I'll show you this. Let's go here. Or to kind of guide the way a little bit or mentorship because it is intimidating and you don't know where to go and you don't know where to ride and, you know, you don't know all the things about the bike or a bike fit. And so I think a little bit of mentorship, like either finding a club or finding a group of girlfriends or, or whatever it is, um, I think is important to have, have people. And then it's just more fun anyway. And you can see, I mean, for me, starting out, it really helped to ride with Greg and watch him ride stuff that I couldn't do and be like, oh, okay, like someone can actually ride that. Okay, I got a visual in my head. So, I, yeah, I think having friends around is super important. Yeah. Was there ever, ever a time that you felt intimidated or unwelcome into the sport of cycling? Intimidated? Yes, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say unwelcome, but intimidated for sure. And part of that was my inexperience. Like we talked about the barriers to the sport, but part of the reason I launched something called the SRAM Gold Rush Tour is because I was at Sea Otter one year as a SRAM sponsored athlete, you know, but pretty new in my bike racing career. And I was trying to go up to the SRAM booth because I needed a chain, you know, I needed some help with my bike. And you know, there's this line of all these guys and it's packed and I basically couldn't, you know, standing room only, couldn't get in. And I felt intimidated to actually go in and ask them and say, hey, you need help with this. Because one, I, I didn't really know my bike very well, but then there was all these guys standing around who seemed to know a lot more about bikes than I did. And even as a SRAM athlete, I was intimidated to go in. And so I went to them with that later and said, you know, I think we need to do some women's stuff to like open the doors a little bit more. And so that launched the SRAM Gold Rush Tour four years ago, which are just a bunch of women's events I do to break down, you know, the barriers of entry. And it's like question answer, it's bike clinics, it's riding with girls, riding with women, it's teaching people about the bike, about suspension setup, about all those things so that, so that it doesn't seem scary. And so absolutely, I saw that need. And I think once you fling the doors open and, and kind of invite women in, it's been really cool to actually see, and you see a lot more female cyclists now. It's really fun to see that. Yeah. So I, I was intimidated, but I decided to try to do something about it. And, you know, that's what I tell a lot of other people. It's like we're all mentors to somebody, you know, even if you're not a pro or whatever, like you can get your friend into cycling or you can teach them how to change a flat tire or you can show them the local trails. So we can kind of all build that community just by inviting somebody else along. Um, let's talk about that a little bit more. So okay. we're in a male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. um, your profession is heavily, you know, still male-dominated. Mm -hmm. Um, cycling is a sport. Uh, how do you, what are the biggest hurdles to women in cycling right now? And what do you think are ways that we can kind of grow and overcome that? I think some of the hurdles are just, um, 
you know, not seeing enough examples of female mechanics or female shop owners or shop managers or, you know, female pros. And I think the more that people see those examples, like Nike is a really cool example of it, you know, with how much their girls divisions have grown, you know, just in a few years of that be that organization operating. Um, it's like once you see that somebody else is doing it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, maybe I can do it too. And so, I do think just sort of the more we spread the community, the more, you know, we educate and teach, you know, female mechanics, female bike journalists, female racers and provide little opportunities for them. Um, it grows pretty fast and I'm already, you're already seeing the tentacles kind of be put out there, which is really cool. Um, so it's just opening the door. It's inviting people. It's really actually kind of simple. Um, and it is changing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're the queen of pain. Mm hmm. <laughs> how, can, uh, uh, how can pain be good for a rider and when can it be negative? Pain, I mean, pain is part of any sport, you know, pain is part of any job, actually. You know, most jobs have good and bad things, you know, and um, what I've found is, you know, I don't love pain. I, you know, I feel it normally just like anybody else. But what I have found is that, you know, physical pain, a lot of times or our limitations are just kind of they're made up things. They're not real, you know, um, and you can see it in, you know, people who thought they could never run a marathon, you know, and, and, you know, 10 years ago, running a marathon was this really big deal. And now, you know, people like everybody's grandmother can run a marathon at this point, um, because they push their limits a little further or a hundred mile bike ride or anything. So I, I think that, you know, pushing past physical pain, I think makes us mentally stronger. Um, and I think your body's going to want to give up, you know, a lot, or your mind's going to want to give up a lot sooner than your body will. And I think kind of pushing through those things and finding that next level is, is sort of how I really grow as a person. And I, I see it a lot with people who've completed Leadville or they've completed something they didn't think they could do. And then all of a sudden, you know, they have more confidence in their job. They have more confidence at home. They have more confidence in a lot of ways. And so that's the good part of pain of bike racing is like, I think, I really do think people become a better person when they see what they can do, you know, then they feel stronger. Um, but you know, obviously, yeah, it's like, if you have a knee injury, you have a back injury, you know, there's a different kind of pain versus just, Oh, this stinks. I want to stop. You know, I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty and bleeding. And yeah, it's... exactly. But it's a lesson, you know, I have to keep learning too. Just like I said, that bike race in Brazil just recently, I was, you know, in a lot of pain and wanted to stop and hated it, you know, but then the next day we had a great day in one stage. So it's like, you know, yeah. ebbs and flows for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you set goals for yourself? The goal, I need to basically have races or have things on the calendar or have a little bit of an agenda because I think inherently at heart, I'm a very lazy person. <laughs> and Surprising. It's, it, no, it's hard for me to get out or get off the couch. I mean, it's, it's definitely easier to be sedentary than it is to be active. Um, and so I have to have races on the calendar just to kind of keep me honest. And I have to make, you know, ride dates with friends just to get me out the door. Um, and so for me, setting goals has to be something tangible like that. Like, oh, let's go riding at two. And, oh, I'm going to do a race in three weeks. Because um, otherwise, it's, it's just kind of easy, too easy to be like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. So I do have to kind of have regular goals to keep, keep me honest and yeah. keep me off the couch. <laughs> well, and I think that's, uh, I mean, that's such a great story. You know, you're much more relatable, you know, to, you know, women getting into cycling to be like, all right, well, Rebecca Rush needs to sign yeah. up just to get her ass off the couch. Like maybe I can do something. It's so too. true. And I think that's so great. You know, it's so humanizing. And Well, we are humans. Even, even if you're a pro athlete, you're, yeah. we're all human and we have the same insecurities, the same, you know, the same struggles with trying to get out the door, get on the bike, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what's your next goal? <laughs> the next goal, well, um, I've pitched a project to uh, ride the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Vietnam. And so that's kind of, I feel like the trajectory of my bike racing is kind of going the direction of wanting to combine my adventure racing experience um, with the bike. So big, long, adventurous rides. Kind of, I did the Coca Pelli Trail last year. Um, 
I tempted uh, Jay Peter Berry's snow bike race, you know, <laughs> last year. But that whole like really ultra endurance cycling, bike packing, adventure sort of riding is, is sort of where where my uh, mind is going right now. And so I think there's some of that in my future for sure. And I need to sell that book. That's my that's my my other thing. It's like okay, let's keep that out the door. <laughs> So, okay, you've got a new book. I do. Uh, Hardest thing I ever did. Right. Way harder than uh, riding 24-hour solo race, <laughs> adventure racing, much harder than all of that. Sure. Uh, well, tell us a little bit more about it. Um, it's basically, uh, I was uh, talked into doing it, which is good. Um, you know, I ha for years people would oh, you should write a book, you should write a book. And there was part of me was like, ah, you know, what do I have to say? What does anybody care, you know, about my story? Um, but I was really pushed by, you know, my co-author Celine and Velo Press came to me directly and they're like, no, no, we want you to tell your story. And so um, it was a challenge that an ended up in my lap and I kind of figured, okay, I'm, I better do this. I better try to try to make this happen. And it was uh, less than a year, nine months of like really intense work. Um, and I mean, the coolest part in the middle of it, I hated it. It was awful. Like it was really hard for me to stay, you know, seated for that long to sit in my office and try to dredge up these stories, try to make them interesting to other people and know what do people want to read? What are they not? And what to include, what not to include. And then the editing process was also really challenging of like back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, by the time it was done, I was just like, get this away. But now I've read it actually myself just recently cover to cover. And, and I mean, the cool part was going back and looking at stuff I've done and like calling up old friends and looking at old pictures like slides and you know little photo albums from years ago um, and it was a really cool process that I think a lot of people should look back and like pat themselves on the back a little we're always looking forward and like what's next what can I do next what can I do better and you know what's the next thing without actually kind of reversing and going man I that was pretty cool what I did and I'm gonna call my friends and tell them thanks for such a good time like I think it's we don't make photo albums anymore. We don't actually like review a trip once it's over. We're like on to the next thing. So that was the cool part about the book. And, you know, in the end, what I hope people take from it is that they, you know, read some of my stories and it inspires them to go out and do something cool on their own. You know, I don't really feel the need that people had to hear my story, but if it makes them want to go do something really cool, then that, that'll be a success for me. Um, so nutrition is a big part of the sport and especially important if you're doing, you know, these ultra endurance events, which you're doing. Uh, so how do you prepare for rides? What do you do during the ride? And then, you know, how, how do you take care of your body and nutrition afterwards? Yeah, I think fueling is, is one of the number one things that, that people mess up and super important. You know, if you don't put the right gas in the car, it's not going to go. Um, and from my adventure racing days, I mean, we were eating Cheetos and Swedish fish and just eating whatever you could basically and, and kind of figuring, okay, we're going for seven days straight. Let's just get anything in our bodies. And kind of as I've aged an athlete, I've gotten more educated on nutrition <laughs> and, um, and kind of honed it in a little bit better. And I have a pretty dialed in program. I mean, before... Um, kind of my favorite race breakfast is uh, rice and eggs and avocado. It's one of the kind of standbys that it's just simple, it's digestible, it's easy to cook. And then, you know, right before an event and, and leading up to it, I'm trying to hydrate really well, obviously, before that and get sort of the cells really saturated um, kind of before the event. But then half an hour out, you know, stop drinking so that you can go to the bathroom, be at the start line, ready to go. <laughs> you don't have to pull your bib shorts down. Um, and then during the race, I'm really strict about whether it's, you know, a, a five hour race, a, a 13 hour race, 24 hour race. I'm pretty strict about planning my food per hour. So like for Coquipelli trail, for example, I, I planned for 15 hours. I laid it all out every hour, you know, about 200 calories, at least, you know, a 24 ounce water bottle, if not more. And then that's basically policing myself every hour so that the food is coming in in pretty, uh, set increments. And, you know, it takes the thinking out of it. It gives you, you know, an even um, energy sort of supply instead of sort of eating a whole bunch. And then, you know, two hours later, you're like, oh, I haven't eaten anything. And th then you're in kind of the dangerous bonk. Um, 
land. I think what a lot of people do in endurance events, they forget to, they don't start their eating and fueling right at the beginning of the race. You know, there's excitement, lead built, for example, everybody's, there's tons of people, everybody's all amped up. And then, you know, they'll go in two hours into the race, realize they haven't, they'll reach the first aid station and their water bottles are full. One, it's like you carried all that weight for nothing and it's not in your body. And so, um, for me, you know, I'll start fueling 15 minutes, you know, into the race and then it's pretty regimented every hour, you know, and I have a system where I have like unopened food in my right pocket and then trash goes in my left pocket. So like I always know, okay, how much have I eaten? Have I eaten enough for this hour and checking the water bottles? Um, so it's, I mean, you're never hungry in a race. You never want to eat necessarily, especially if you're working hard. But um, if you skip an hour, if, you, if that doesn't happen, um, your body's just at some point is going to stop. It's hard enough to race, so I try to be really strict about making sure the nutrition is on board. And I really like um, Roctane is one of my main fuels from Goo because it's it's calories and liquid all in one. And a lot of times just the simple act of having to open a package and chew something is too hard. You're like, oh, I don't want to do it. It's too hard. And so drinking calories is actually really easy for um, a super difficult event for me. So I'll do a lot of calories that way. Electrolytes are super important at the very end of the race. Red Bull's always the like go to when nothing else will work, and you're just running on fumes, and you know, kind of need that last hour. And then afterwards, I always try to I have a rule. You know, before an adult beverage, I have my goo chocolate smoothie recovery drink. So like that's the rule, and then you can celebrate. <laughs> so yeah, recovery drink right away. And and the reason I do all that stuff, it's like you know, I'm an older athlete. I race against athletes 20 years younger than me and oftentimes I'm beating them because not because physically on paper I'm any better in fact they probably have the edge but I try to be smarter about things like nutrition and taking care of myself um, and resting and those are the things where you can really extend and improve for a long time you know well into years that you would think would be past your prime if you're just smarter than everybody else sure our bodies are number one machine Absolutely. Yeah. How to really manage that. When you can have a super nice S-Works bike, all that, but if the the body on top of it's not functioning at an S-Works yeah. level, then, you know, the super nice bike doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually just curious. Um, you've had the opportunity to ride many different bikes. Uh, favorite mountain bike? Right now, today? I'm riding the Era, which I am so stoked about. I've been waiting for that bike for a while. Um, and I, I rode it in Brazil and it's awesome. I mean, every year I'm like, oh, God, Specialized made the best bike ever. And then I'm not just saying that, but then the next year they'll make something new. I'm like, whoa, this is actually the best bike ever. Like, I don't know how they do it, but the engineering's pretty amazing. And the Era is, I mean, it really is my dream bike. It's sort of everything I've always wanted. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's one bike to kind of do it all for me. And the new uh, little, the small command post is yeah. awesome. Okay. Yeah, I rode it in Brazil. And I'm like, that can't make that much difference. Like, is it really worth the way? And it totally yeah. does. It's awesome. Um, so what are your favorite goo flavors? Uh, salted caramel is very high on the list right now. And they also have caramel macchiato is a brand new what? one. Yes. Brand new at Interbike. That All one's right. really good. We were actually putting it in coffee at Interbike. <laughs> <laughs> mm, and yeah. on top of ice cream but yeah those yeah. are my yeah caramel macchiato um salted caramel and they also have um a lemonade flavor lemonade okay. roctane that i actually i really like and because sometimes i don't always want the sweet you know you want a little bit less sweetness and that's where i really like the kind of tartness of the lemonade one sure yeah <laughs> um will you sign my book yes absolutely <laughs>